Imagine being invited to a dinner party where these people were on the guest list. Abraham Lincoln, Theodore Roosevelt, Robert Schumann, Ludwig von Beethoven, Edgar Allan Poe, Mark Twain, and even Vincent van Gogh. When you arrive, Schumann and Beethoven are discussing the movements in their most recent musical compositions. Poe and Twain are listening to Van Gogh talk about the meaning of his art, <laughs> while Roosevelt and Lincoln discuss politics. You wonder to yourself why these people are here. After all, this is a fundraiser to help people suffering from depression. <laughs> Maybe they all have someone in the family who suffers from depression. The time arrives during the dinner for speeches by special guests. You're shocked as one by one, each of these famous people describes their own battle with depression. Lincoln even quotes from a letter he wrote to a friend years earlier. I am now the most miserable man living. If what I feel were equally distributed to the whole human race, there would be not one cheerful face on earth. Whether I shall be better, I cannot tell. I awfully forebode I shall not. To remain as I am is impossible. I must die or be better. It appears to me. He encourages everyone to persevere, for he says some years later, he wrote this in another letter. The year that is drawing toward the close has been filled with the blessings of fruitful fields, fields and healthier skies. These bounties are so constantly enjoyed that we are prone to forget the source from which they come. Today, we are talking about dealing with the cloud of depression. Let's pray. God, I want to thank you, Father, that in the midst of you being the great I am, in the midst of everything else, Father, you minister to the hearts of your people today, those deep berries maybe they've told no one about. And I thank you, Spirit of God, that you minister life and encouragement, Father, through the YouTubes, through the message, through the examples, through everything. And we thank you in advance, Father, for your word going forth with signs following in Jesus' name. Do you ever feel like that? There's this little guy under this cloud and sometimes you've got this smile. People say, how are you doing? Oh, I'm fine. And you've got this smile on your face, but that's what you're really dealing with. And there's different kind of depression, so I'm going to kind of lump them all together. So Dr. Black, if you'll excuse me on that, she's our <laughs> professional there. But here's some of what I want to share with you. Depression is a mood disorder that causes a persistent feeling of sadness and a loss of interest in activities once enjoyed. I got to admit there was a time in my life I went through that. I was in a horrible relationship for a couple of years. And some of the symptoms I demonstrated were uh, guilt, mm -hmm. shame, 20 pound weight loss in three months because I put a big D on my chest. And I lost interest until I got help. Also called major depressive disorder or clinical depression, it negatively affects how you feel, think and behave and can lead to a variety of emotional and physical problems. It isn't the same as depression caused by a loss such as a death of a loved one or medical conditions such as a thyroid disorder. Sometimes there's side effects from drugs that can cause it. Sometimes it's diabetes or a medical disorder or something else that can, that can play into it. So there's no judgment on this. And sometimes in the church we don't talk about these things and I really, really, really felt led to talk a little bit about this because I talked to a couple people this week and they said, oh, the holidays are coming and I'm going to be alone and they were beginning to feel depressed. And I thought, let's nip this in the bud now. Let's, let's talk about this. Amen? Amen? So what are some of the symptoms of depression? They can include a depressed mood. Reduce interest or pleasure in activities previously enjoyed. Loss of sexual desire. Unintentional weight loss without dieting or low appetite. Insomnia. <coughs> difficulty sleeping or hypersomnia, excessive sleeping. Psychomotor agitation, for example, restlessness, pacing up and down, or psychomotor retardation, slowed movements and speech. Fatigue or loss of energy feelings of worthlessness or guilt, worsened ability to think, concentrate, or make decisions, recurrent thoughts of death or suicide or attempted suicide. Mm. And sadly, we've seen a lot of that. Uh, Robin Williams just broke our heart. And so many times we th see the people who laugh the most. I read some other things about Lincoln, and it said he had a witty sense of humor. Mm -hmm. And he did that on purpose because that kept him alive. Mm. And back then, they didn't know how to deduce this, so he went to the doctor, and that didn't help. It didn't do anything, and he felt even worse after he got back. So these are some of the symptoms. We're talking about this cloud of depression, and I don't care if it's a minor thing or a major thing. Let's go on to the next slide. I don't know, understand these totally, but 
The doctors are now listing these. They give names to everything these days. But I'm going to tell you right now, if any of these things apply to you, you are more than a label. Yes. I said dealing with the cloud of depression. I did not say I am depressed. The moment you say the I am, you are putting yourself in the state of it. The moment you say I'm dealing with this or overcoming it, there's a big difference. And I will test my life on that because I was overcoming fibromyalgia. I was overcoming the symptoms. And if you get that revelation, you're overcoming these things. So here's some of them. Major depressive disorder, that's the worst one. Then there's dysthmic disorder, and that one I believe, if I read properly, it's more, it's for a longer period of time, it's more persistent, but the symptoms aren't as intense. Then of course we know bipolar disorder. That's the swing from happy, happy, extreme happiness to sadness and depression. Postpartum depression. People have told women they were crazy, and some women do go through those extreme hormonal changes after having a baby. Seasonal affective disorder. We thrive on sunshine. Sunshine is the vitamin D that we need, and it makes you happy, happy. And doctors are now discovering that if you're deficient in vitamin D, you may need some more sunshine or just to get a little, little supplement for maybe three bucks for 120 little soft gels. Little dabble D, and that's all it is. Uh, that's during these seasonal changes when we have less sunshine. Premenstrual dysphoric disorder. That's beyond the PMS symptoms. That woman is really hurting. And atypical depression, which I've read, starts a lot of times in childhood. So these are some of the things that maybe we've gone through and we didn't even realize or we know someone has. So if it's not you, just take it with a grain of salt and it is, it is you, I got good news for you. And then what are the causes of depression? Look at that person. They're feeling unimportant, retarded, unwanted, shameful. The causes of depression are not fully understood but are likely to be a complex combination of genetic, biological, environmental, and psychosocial factors. Well, thank you very much. That's about everything we're saying, so <laughs> that's all of it. And I would throw in their food sometimes because there's certain foods that can cause issues. That's from a nutritional standpoint. Listen to this. According to the World Health Organization, depression is the most common illness worldwide and the leading cause of disability. They estimate that 350 million people are affected by depression globally and that by the year 2020, depression will be the second highest ability in the world, second only to blindness. According to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, 7.6% of people over the age of 12 have depression in any two-week period. The National Institute of Mental Health tells us that depression is the number one disability among Americans aged 15 to 24, preventing millions of people from being able to finish school or hold down a job. And Psychology Today talks about the phenomenon by which companies lose billions of dollars every year in lost productivity to depressed employees who come to work but don't actually work. You see, depression is real and can be debilitating as a physical obstacle. But we don't have to stay there. I say that again, we don't have to stay there. Amen. Depression can also be a sign of hopelessness that causes a person to feel helpless, anxious, defeated, or angry to avoid their emotions. And sometimes you don't even feel those things. You go past it and you're numb. But they don't have to stay there. God is so good. I was praying about this. and I was saying, Lord, I really hope I can find a YouTube on Inside Out. That was one of the best Disney films from 2015 talking about emotions. And I want us to look at this little clip. This gentleman went ahead and, and uh, put a little part of it, and it's about what causes anxiety and depression. It's a YouTube by Mindset. Anxiety and depression is something that causes pain for people all over the world. In this scene from Inside Out, we get a very clear example of how people can get stuck avoiding their emotions and start to experience things such as intense anxiety or deep depression. The film Inside Out depicts a young girl struggling with a traumatic experience of moving home. This movie very accurately describes why people get anxious in this world and why we need to be allowed to be upset and uncomfortable even in public sometimes. In a scene from Inside Out, Riley has a situation where she is called on to talk about her life. She feels okay remembering her old feelings until she reaches the point where she realizes that her happy life that she knows of is gone. 
In that moment, she needs to embrace sadness to help cleanse that moment. But instead, because of happiness struggling with sadness, she gets caught in place where those feelings remain unresolved. Cool kids was prank at three o'clock. No. Did you see that look? No. They're judging us. Somebody help me grab. Joy, no. That's a core Stop memory. It. Stop it. Let's Wait. Go. It is never nice to have to cry in public, but sometimes when we experience a traumatic event, we need to get upset, scream, cry, or whatever to reach closure on that situation. As a result of not getting closure, Riley becomes jaded and scared to talk to anyone. In fear of having to experience the uncomfortable feeling of being emotional and upset in public again. Therefore, many people who suffer from anxiety, and particularly social anxiety, find themselves in this kind of trap. Trying to avoid those feelings again and again, and so they get anxious. In order to release the panic, a person needs to heal that trauma. They need to feel okay with being themselves, no matter how vulnerable that is. Once we have time to grieve and we feel supported, it is easier to again embrace happy thoughts. Riley can't be done with me. Hey, who's ticklish, huh? Here comes the tickle monster. Hey, bing bong, look at this. We can get over feeling sad quite rapidly once we are allowed to gain a resolution to our pain. Never try to hide your feelings when they surface. They are essential to our well-being to be experienced. You took something that you loved. It's gone forever. Sadness, don't make him feel worse. Sorry. It's all I had left of Riley. I bet you and Riley had great adventures. Oh. They were wonderful. Once we flew back in time, we had breakfast twice that day. Sadness! It sounds amazing. I bet Riley liked it. Oh, she did. We were best friends. Yeah, it's sad. <laughs> I'm okay now. Come on, the train station is this way. How did you do that? Well, I don't know. I... Wait, you gotta fix this. Get up there. Sadness, it's up to you. Me? Sadness? Sadness? I can't, Joy. Yes, you can. Riley needs you. Joy finally recognizes that sadness cannot be avoided. Sadness is, is an essential part of the healing process. Once Joy realizes this, she allows sadness to affect the core memories so that finally Riley can let out her emotions and in doing so, start to rebuild who she is and how she feels about things. If we try to be happy all the time and not allow ourselves to get upset ever, then it keeps us trapped. So this is definitely something that we need to do. This flow of emotions will keep us balanced and stop us getting stuck in anxiety or major depression. You are a naturally happy and good person to be around. So don't rob yourself of those moments that you need to cleanse your hurts from the past. If you find yourself still feeling uncomfortable, just remember that it is important to be yourself. Little by little, if you get back to the feeling of feeling good about who you are, then things get easier and easier. See, we never talk about that. We think we have to just go happy, happy, happy. Now, if you're really happy, I mean, I'm wacko sometimes, so that's really me. But when I'm sad, I'm going to tell someone. I remember one time, I think it was Elder Wendy was at my house, and, or she was just coming over for something, and I said, hey, I need, I need prayer right now. And that was okay. But we try to be these super Christians. We, know, we already are super Christians. We're made in God's image. But let's be real. Let's be real. When I became a Christian, I think I shared this before, that um, I wasn't sure how to pray. So I looked through the Psalms, 
And David, I related to David. Not only did he play an instrument, and I sort of, aside from the zinger I made today, <laughs> I play keyboard and piano and stuff, right? Good. But he seemed like he was a sensitive soul who really went through some stuff. But then by the time he was done pouring his heart out, he felt better. And take a look sometimes in Psalm 6. He cries out to God. He's depressed. But by the time he gets to the end, he remembers his God. Psalms 102 in the message, oh my gosh, it says this at the beginning. A prayer of one whose life is falling to pieces and who lets God know just how bad it is. <laughs> I thought of you, Elder Brian, reading that. And it's so bad that David can't eat. He's losing weight. He's crying his eyes out. But he remembers who his God is at the end. Let's take a look at this one. Psalm 77, 1 through 10. I want to applaud, and I'm so appreciative of um, Elder Veronica. She was very vulnerable, and she shared about a year ago what she went through. And I think she shared with us that she went through this. The first part, I yell out to God. I yell with all my might. And she tells of a time when she literally did that. No one else was there, and she was just talking to God. And, you know, we think he's going to get upset, or we think, I can't do that. That's not prim and proper. After all, I'm the head, not the tail. I'm above and not beneath. I'm this and I'm that. No, in that moment, what are you really feeling? What are you dealing with? This is Asaph. We don't know if Asaph, who he's a musician with David, we don't know if he just penned this, or we don't know if this was really him penning it for someone else. But it says, I yell out to my God. I yell with all my might. I yell at the top of my lungs. He listens. He listens. Okay, so what does he do now? He's going to pour out his complaint. He says, I found myself in trouble and went looking for my Lord. Praise God. So what to do? Deal with what you feel. Take it to God in prayer. And that's what he's doing. He says, my life was an open wound that wouldn't heal. Sounds like clinical depression to me. When friends said, everything will turn out all right, I didn't believe a word they said. I remember God and shake my head. I bow my head, then wring my hands. I'm awake all night, not a wink of sleep. I can't even say what's bothering me. You're going through it so bad, you don't even know what the root is. I go over the days one by one. I ponder the years gone by. I strum my lute, because he's a musician, all through the night wondering how to get my life together. Will the Lord walk off and leave us for good? Will he never smile again? Is his love worn threadbare? Has his salvation promise burned out? Has God forgotten his manners? Has he angrily stalked off and left us? Just my luck, I said. The high God goes out of business just the moment I need him. <laughs> That's where he was feeling. And as much as that doesn't sound good, and as much as it's not a great confession, he was being real and he got it out. Let's go on. The story doesn't stop there. After he says that, he said God listens. Well, if God listens, when we're praying, then we listen. Here's the response he got. Ha. Ah. He's sitting there now, and he's feeling something else. And he goes, hmm, once again, I'll go over what God has done. Lay out on the table the ancient wonders. I'll ponder all the things you've accomplished. Notice now he's not centered on him. Notice it's all about God. I'll ponder all the things you've accomplished and give a long, loving look at your acts. Oh, God, your way is holy. No God is great like God. You're the God who makes things happen. You're the God who makes things happen. I tell you right now, if you're going through stuff, God's the God that can make things happen for you, even no matter what you're going through. You showed everyone what you can do. You pulled your people out of the worst kind of trouble, rescued the children of Jacob and Joseph, and it goes on even further. In fact, I don't know if I went all the way through 19. I apologize. That's only a couple verses. But he goes on and he recounts the story of how the Lord delivered them crossing the Red Sea. And suddenly he encouraged himself. Why do you think time after time we say, do you have a testimony? That testimony that you're sharing is going to be a word of encouragement for someone else or to your own self when you're going through something. Praise God. So what do we want to do when we're going through depression? We deal with what we feel. Turn to your neighbor and say, deal with what you feel. Deal with what you feel. Take it to God in prayer. Amen. I have a friend named Dr. Sandra Talby, and she's written a book. She's, a, uh, she's an ordained minister. She's a psychologist. She's a mental health professional. And she wrote a book, and now she's on her second edition of it. And it's called You Can't Heal a Wound by Saying It's Not There, Overcoming Your Past, Embracing Your Future. And she shares a story of... Um, the Velveteen Rabbit, and I won't get into that, but here's her reference to it in her, um, the beginning of it, her epilogue. She says, 
while we are in process, we have this perfect picture image here of how God patiently stands with us and he woos us with a love that is perfect, compelling, overwhelming. Close your eyes when I read these. I'm going to say that again. Close your eyes and receive this. God woos us with a love that is perfect, compelling, overwhelming, unconditional, sacrificial, and never lets go. As we are in the process of becoming real, God loves us to a point where we can begin to piece together all the raggedy, frayed threads of our lives, and then God binds us up and heals the wounds of our soul and through a relationship with Jesus Christ and with each other. God redeems our messed up ears. He grants us a peace that does not exist with anything else, and then he stamps us as his own. You can open your eyes now. That's our God. Dealing with the cloud of depression, we go to him in prayer. And the other thing we do is we embrace the process of becoming real. That's what she's saying. You've got to say, hey, there's really something there. There's really something there. In, in her 25 years of practice, or 35 in uh, being a psychiatrist, psychologist, I think she said that she hasn't met too many people that don't have something they've dealt with. And you know how I ministered a while back that God can cause all things to work together for good? I'm not going to play it, but there's a YouTube by Lisa Miller. She's a professor and director of clinical psychology and a director of the Spiritual Mind Body Institute at Teachers College, Columbia University. And she was wondering if, you know, some depression is an illness, and she says maybe it needs to be recalibrated or rebooted or medicated, but she says it's not always an illness. And so she wanted to know scientifically if she could prove something. So she felt certain that depression and spirituality are two sides to one door. And so, what did she do? Well, she started calling me. Hi. <laughs> That's the phone ringing. No. <laughs> she felt certain that depression and spirituality are two sides to one door and that it seemed well within the reach of science. So she and other scientists got together. Where is it in the brain? Where is depression as a porthole of the spiritual path, not the disease? And so they took two different groups. They took a group of people with families loaded with generations of depression deeply depressed people, and then they took another group of people with family loaded up with generations of depression who through their journey of suffering had reached a foundational spiritual path. And you know what they discovered? See, when a person's depressed, there's a part in the brain that begins to shrink. And what they discovered is that in those regions of the brain which atrophied and withered in lifelong depression, for those people with a strong personal spirituality, there was a thickening of those very same regions. See, our God's a rec recreative God. And the only other time they said this can happen, as they're discovering, sometimes medicine, sometimes, but is with exercise. But they're talking about this. They're talking about being God-centered. So she said, her conclusion was very often, as everyone will face it, Depression is core to our endowment and core to our development. When we walk through the door is the hand that invites, this is her words, that guides and ultimately gives. On the other side of the door is the inspired life brought to us by the presence, brought to us by God. Think about that. So even when you're going through something, and I know some people tell me sometimes, well, you don't know what I've gone through. And I, I thought about it, and you know what? I almost felt like saying, I really don't know what you've gone through because you're still going through it because you're still recounting it. You're going through it. If you're really healed and you've gone through it, it's like I shared the other day. I'd gone through something very, 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 very traumatic with someone, and I was in tears over it and couldn't drive and almost couldn't function one day, and I finally stopped trying to change them and accepted that it is what it is, and God's okay with me and it's fine. And now I literally can see myself but I don't have these hurt feelings anymore. I can see that person and see them through the eyes of love. I can call them with no expectation except to be Jesus to them and pray that they can receive healing because they're going through depression. Why would I expect anything else from a depressed person? But I almost let that impact me. I almost let that impact me, but I got through it. There's a really neat man. He's gone on to be with the Lord now. His name's Leslie Brandt, and he has this book, Prophets Now. I don't remember how I got it, but I fell in love with it. And it's as if the prophets were alive now. 
And this is Isaiah 6 through 8. Listen to this. It was while in the throes of self-pity and depression, even while I was questioning God's concern for me in my world, that I was permitted a unique experience. I do not know that I was struck as if by lightning with a frightening realization that God was near to me, that he was speaking to me, putting thoughts into my head that almost paralyzed me with fear. I saw nothing, but I felt as if I'd never felt before, unworthy, guilty, ashamed yet strangely awed, amazed, overcome by some inexplicable out-of-this-world presence that blotted out for the moment all that was associated with natural life on this planet. As if propelled by some invisible force, I flung myself to the ground, clawing blindly at the sticks and stones that lay about me. Then all self-doubt all doubts dissolved. All questions dissipated like smoke in the wind. The conflicts and problems that brought me to this hour suddenly vanished. It was as if nothing upon this earth existed and nothing else mattered except that precise moment in the presence of this indefinable, indescribable power that permeated and filled the emptiness around me. And it was at that moment in the midst of this powerful presence that I sensed an overwhelming love, a recognition and acceptance as a creature of God, forgiven, redeemed, beloved. My feelings of shame and unworthiness were drowned in a sea of joy and peace, and I knew in a way that I had never known before that I was a son and servant of the living God. Getting in the presence of God. You see, depression can, as I read one, one minister, it was a minister who had had these traumatic experiences. He never dealt with them, and he's a minister now, and it got to the point his wife finds him curled up in a fetal position. That's how bad it got. He couldn't function. And he's the one who said, depression can take you to the bottom, but you don't have to stay there. Depression can take you to the bottom, but you don't have to stay there. I call this a God incident, this next uh, YouTube. I'm not going to say anything except let it speak for itself. Go ahead and play this. I said yes when I wanted to say no, I don't want to do that. He became physically violent with me. I had never been in an abusive relationship before and I don't have the, I, I felt as if I didn't have the profile of a woman who would ever be abused verbally, emotionally, and sure not physically. And I remember when that relationship finally ended and I was grateful that it ended and I was alive because there were some days when my life was in danger. I had so much guilt and anger and blame and more than anything, shame. How did I get here? And the bigger question was, how will I get out? How do I move from this place? I remember sitting in the doctor's office, sitting on the table, and she asked me a myriad of questions. She left the room and came back with a piece of paper in her hand, and she said, Lisa, you are clinically depressed, and I need to give you this prescription. I looked at the piece of paper, and it said, Lisa Nichols Prozac. I didn't see that level of sad coming. I think when sad comes, you don't know it's coming. It's a little, one little circumstance, another circumstance, another missed moment where you don't speak your mind, another moment when you don't say what's on your heart, another moment when you say yes and you really wanted to say no, another moment when you just put everyone else in front of you. And here I was in the doctor's office, clinically depressed. I asked my doctor, could I do something before I fulfilled the prescription? Could I try something else? Because when she said I was really, really sad, what I realized was that I had just forgot who I was. That I had become Jelani's mom, that's all I was. I had become his fiance, that's all I was. And then I was the woman that he abused. And then I was the daughter trying to hide the abuse from my father and my mother. And then I was the motivational speaker trying to hide the fact that I was sad from everyone. I just forgot who I was. And so I asked her, can I have 30 days to just discover me again? And I did three things. 
One, I put affirmations all around my house, reminding me who I was. You are an unrepeatable miracle. You are beautiful in your own right. You are, you deserve healthy love. You are a child of God. Everywhere I could look in my house was a post-it note reminding me of who I was. I read scriptures and I read words that showed me my birthright. And then every day I got in the mirror and I completed three sentences. I looked in my eyes and I said, Lisa, I'm proud that you and I found seven things to celebrate Lisa for. And the second sentence was, Lisa, I forgive you for. And I found seven different things to cut the shackles of blame, shame, guilt, regret, and anger around. And I said, Lisa, I commit to you that. And I made seven different commitments to myself every day for 30 days. And when I went back to the doctor, I was completely ready to take the prescription and fill it if I needed to. And I share it with her. She asked me question after question after question again. And then at the end, she goes, I have two questions for you, Lisa. I said, what? She said, what have you been doing for the last 30 days? And can I use it with other patients? Because I have found my way back to me. And another moment that I'm super, super grateful for was when my daddy took me on my first date. <laughs> I was 12 years old. And he took me out to a restaurant on the pier in Marina Del Rey. And um, he ordered my drink and ordered my food and opened the car door and all the things you would do on a great date that I didn't know anything about at 12. And at the end of the evening, I went to walk in the house and my father was opening, holding the door open for me. And he closed the door so I could not get in. And I stopped and I was like, Daddy, what's wrong? And he said, I want you to know something, Lisa. Tonight I took you on your first date so you get to see how you get to be treated. I wanted you to see how you get to be treated. Now, sweetheart, how you choose to be treated, that's gonna be on you. The big moments in your life are made up by the little decisions you make. I didn't make a big decision to get in an abusive relationship. I made a little decision to lower my integrity bar. I made another little decision to stay when I saw the first sign that he didn't honor me the way I deserved to be honored. I made a little decision when I crossed over, moved past that moment of discomfort and allowed his words to make up for his behavior. It was my job to fall madly in love with me first, that no one was going to show me how to love me, that I have to show not only me how to love me, but I had to show other people how to love me, that you are the first example of what loving you looks like and the way you love you is the way the world's gonna love you. So when you say, uh, I don't need rest, then we believe you. When you say, no, don't worry about me, I'm fine, we believe you. When you say, no, I don't need help, we believe you. When you say, I'm fine by myself, we believe you. So here's what I realized, words are power, words, Words speak life. Words, your life is a physical manifestation of the conversation going on in your head. And it's a physical manifestation of the words that are falling across your lips. And if you want to create a better life, design a better conversation. If you want to design a better conversation, think a better thought. Not about them, but first about you. And if you can feel it right now, something stirring in your soul, just that little something, you can't even describe it, then you're still in the game. It ain't over yet. It's never too late. At 20, at 40, at 55, at 75, at 88, it ain't ever too late to press reset and fall madly in love with the life that you've been given. And then you'll look up and your life is barely. Then you look up and your life is barely recognizable. I'm a girl from South Central LA living between the Harlem Crip 30s and the rolling 60s. Had three fights a week to get home from school. Got kicked out of college. I was considered academically challenged. I'm, functioning dys I'm functionally dyslexic, still. I wear everything as a badge. I'm fine with it. It's not, I'm not successful in spite of it. My success is beautiful because of it. <laughs> I'm that woman who was on government's assistance. Okay. I'm that woman who got out of an abusive relationship. Okay. But I'm also that woman who's authored or co-authored seven bestsellers. I'm also that woman who's a CEO of a multi-million dollar business. I'm also the woman who has an international brand and touches over 30 million people a year. I'm also that woman. Don't wear the labels and don't let the labels wear you. You're bigger than a label. 
I'm a woman before I'm a mother. I'm a woman before I'm a CEO. I'm a woman before I'm a daughter. I'm a woman first, all things. I'm not a hero, I wanna be a shero. And I wanna give her a chance. And I, I say to you as your sister, you don't think you get to press reset, you better think again. It is not over. Matter of fact, it just begun. Amen. There was a lot said in there, but I gleaned two things off of this that, I, that God gave me the other day for you. And this is for me, and this is for all of us. These aren't hard to remember, so Andrew, if you can put these two things up. Choose to change, decide to do something different. And what do I mean by that? We've been told so much that if you're depressed, you're going to stay depressed forever. It's almost like if you have this disease, you're going to be that way forever. And I'm not saying there aren't times people need medical help, so if there's any doctors out there, I'm not dissing you. But I'm saying choose to change. Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, and it ain't working. Choose to change. What are we changing? Number one, we're changing how we see ourselves. It's time to get in agreement with what God says about us. That's it. Period. No more of this, I'm not worthy, no more of this, not accepting compliments, no more of this, beating ourselves up, no more. It's time. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's time. You on live stream, it's time. I struggled with this today going, oh my God, do I have to say this? But he told me for me, it's time. Because the other day, I got a little depressed over something and I was losing my hope about something. But he told me to get back on it. And as she said, you're still alive. So choose to change. Choose to change how you see yourself. Get in agreement with what God feels, says, and believes about you. His opinion of you should be your only opinion of you. And if in doubt, I encourage everyone to get a hold of the mirror version of the Bible because it goes according to the original Greek, and that defines what God says about us instead of the religious mindset that we've embraced sometimes with judgment and fire and brimstone. God loves us. He wouldn't have gone to the cross lest he loved us. And it's a done deal, saints. He loves us. So choose to change. Turn to your neighbor and say, choose to change. Point to yourself and say, I choose to change. Now, if you felt the change going, how do I do that? Well, number one, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Number two, it's God, as I said, this is my life verse, who lives in us to will and to do of his good pleasure. So there's no way we can't succeed. There's no way we can't. And what does decide to do something different mean? Do what? Remember who you are. Years ago, remember the Lion King? Yes. I taught from that when it first came out. Remember who you are. Sometimes you've forgotten who you are. Yes. Meditate. And I don't know what the, what the clinical word is. Is it ruminate or ruminate? There's a word that they use. But basically, ruminate. Thank you. So remember who you are. And they said actually some of the things to do that were healing are called self-talk. Uh -huh. Whether you do it by yourself or with someone. And they call it ruminate. Bible calls it meditate. Meditate about your future, not your past. I'm not saying not to deal with it. If there's hurts, go and get healed of the hurt. Because guess what, guys? We are stuck at the point that we're hurt. Yeah. If I was 14 and something happened to me, I'd be stuck at 14. The past five to 10 years, I've made a conscious decision that if I am going through something as painful as it was, and I gave someone permission to tell me something the other day I didn't like, and I needed it, and I thanked them after. I give them permission that if I'm going through something that's going to cause me to be stuck, I give you permission to tell me. And you guys should be doing the same thing with each other. You should have that base of people. Another um, YouTube said that the thing about depression is we were never meant to be isolated. We're a community. We're supposed to be a community who needs each other. That's another healing element. Do something different. Meditate about your future, not your past. Here's a note I wrote. The more you think about your past, the more likely you're to be depressed. And if someone says, well, you don't know what I've gone through, I feel like saying, honey, you don't know what I've gone through. Who cares? We all got stories. Yes, it's important. I do care, but don't be stuck to use that as like a one-up thing. Don't do that. Just say, you know what, I've gone through this, enough's enough, too much is plenty, I want my healing, what do I need to do? And it means get in the closet with God and pray, it means get with one another and say, look, this is it. It means to forgive yourself. Another one to do, what did she say? Love yourself. Forgive yourself of the blame and the shame and the regret and the anger. Oh, how I wish I hadn't screwed up after I became a Christian. I had this perfect, I was wonderful on the outside before I was saved, and then I become a Christian, get to know God, and all the yuck yuck comes out, and I screw up all over. But guess what? Thank God it came out. And as she said, these are just things that happen to us, and as a result, it causes us to seek him. Had she not had that smack dab in her face thing with the doctor, and praise God, if someone needs to be on Prozac, a little bit fine, but she said, no, this isn't me. 
She said, can I do something else? Can I do something else? And that which she did is so awesome that the doctor is now using it for other people. Forgive yourself. Love yourself. And then she said, speak life affirming words over yourself. I am beautiful in God's sight. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. You know, things that you really, and maybe at first your, your, your flesh is going to go, oh, is that really me? Yes, that's you. That's what God said about you. Each one of you are precious in his sight. The reason I love people so much is now I see Jesus in them. I see, oh, my gosh. I was telling, I don't know if I was telling, oh, I think I was telling Mitzen at, at worship practice the other day. I can't even kill a bug because God made a bug. It's sca- I'm weird. I'm sorry. I'm off the deep end. So I'm not going to hurt you if I can't hurt a bug. So. And make a decision that the past is past. I don't care what it is. Now, it's only past to the degree that you're healed. I don't mean denial now. He told me this the other day. He says, get out of the den of denial. I said, okay. Get out of the den of denial. Turn to your neighbor and say, get out of the den of denial. Amen. These are things we know, but this is what he says. So everyone say, choose to change. Choose to change. Decide to do something different. Decide to do something different. Now, if you really mean it, point to yourself and say, I choose to change. I, choose to change. I decide to do something different. Now, notice that word decide is just the decision part. There's that word do. Do is the action part. So if it means you've got to talk to someone today and say, you know what, this happened to me, and I'm done with it. As of today, I'm done with this. No more beating yourself up over the head. Over the head? Yeah, over the head. Wherever. That's a bad. Suddenly I realized what that is. That's painful. wonder why you have a headache. I just finally figured out. And on the other side of it, In the message, in John 10.10, and I love this version, basically it says, God said that we can have a better life than we ever dreamed of. And that doesn't mean we're all millionaires, we're all driving Cadillacs and all whatever that is. It means you're going to have joy beyond joy. And Lisa Nichols has written a book. I want to get a hold of her new book. Um, it's, It's about abundance. And no, she says it's not about abundance. It's about having wealth and this, that, and the other. She's talking about relationships. She's talking about every area of your life. Um, When she started this journey... She was 80 pounds heavier, but then she realized, oh, my gosh, I'm going to deal with the root of why this is happening to me. And as a result, then she changed, and uh, the weight fell off. And I'm telling you today that God desires all the spiritual weights, all the physical weights, all the emotional weights, all the depression stuff, all the cloudiness just to fall. I hit it from every angle, I believe. We can walk through it with them. Our brains can get better. I mean, you know, duh, right? We can pray, and it doesn't matter if you have to be real, like we said, and cry out to God and say, okay, God, ah, right? Is that okay? I don't curse, so for me, it has to be just, ah, that's all I got. (laughs) I don't curse. I never have, so it's like, ugh, I don't. But if I'm just as upset, can I get it out to God? And I say, okay, Lord, I thank you, Lord, that your spirit is within me, and I thank you, Lord, I receive your peace. I receive your healing, and I thank you, Father, that you know that person that just irked me? I'm giving you an example. That person that really irked me that I can't forgive? Lord, I thank you that I choose to forgive them, and Lord, it's not just by faith, it's by feeling. So, Lord, I thank you that you give me your feeling. You show me your eyes of love for that person, so no longer is it an issue. No longer will I talk bad about them to someone else. Okay? I'm so done with looking on Facebook and seeing people talk about people, trashing people. Stop. Stop. Just be God's love. Love yourself. You only can love your neighbor as yourself. Love yourself. Love yourself. Love yourself. And it's a whole process of learning. It doesn't mean you like everything. I love me and I don't like this little pocket of fat here, but I still love me. Hey, you know, be real, but love yourself. We're not that bad. We're worth dying on the cross for, okay? And then Psalms 40, allow God to put a new song in your mouth. That says he's put a new song in my mouth. It actually says he took me out of the muck and mire. So basically, you're out of the depression. You've got this new song now. Maybe next week we're going to talk about the abundant life some more. But that's what I wanted to share. So I pray in Jesus' name that you receive this today. And if you need to, get that YouTube. I showed you both sides of it. One is where give yourself permission to feel and to be real with what you feel. And the other side is don't be stuck there and say, okay, I'm going to take it to you in prayer. And maybe you feel mully grubby at the beginning, but at the end you go, my God, I realize who you are, Lord, and I'm okay. Gold cast. 
Goldcast, G-O-L-D-C-A-S-T. One of the good things I found on Facebook, hallelujah. And I was just praying, saying, Lord, he was just telling me to share this because holidays are coming. Yeah. Holidays are coming, y'all, and there's so many people that deal with it. Depression. Gold. Oh, Goldcast, what do I know? Goldcast, praise God. <laughs> so, Lord, I just thank you for folks. And if, if you right now need prayer, if you want to grab someone's hand, if you want to pray today or if you want to talk to me later on or something, that's why I'm here. I... I just sharing where I've been, and um, hopefully I'm a little further along, th- and praise God. Um, or if you want to talk to someone else you trust, you should have a circle of people to trust. So, Father, I thank you, Lord, that, yes, everyone can experience sadness, whether it's a minor thing. And, yes, Lord, we do walk through grief, but, Lord, we go through it coming out on the other side. And, Lord, maybe there's been challenges that happened to us in the past that are horrendous, as Lisa said, the abuse and different things, Lord. But we don't have to stay stuck. So we thank you, Spirit of God, that we make the choice today. We choose to change. Lord, you said in the Old Testament, you've set before us life and death, blessing, cursing. Choose life. You told us what to choose. We choose life. We choose to change. Change how we see ourselves. Get in agreement with you, Lord. We decide to do something different. What we've done isn't working. And so, Lord, we thank you that we make the decision today. And if we have to do what Lisa did and put affirmations all around our house, look in the mirror and tell ourselves who we really are, love ourselves, forgive ourselves, speak life over ourselves, Lord. We thank you, Father, that we start the process today. If you agree with me and you're serious about that, just stand up where you are so I'll know that that's what your decision is today. Thank you, Father. Lord, I see these people are standing, and I thank you, Father. Unless you can't stand for some reason, then stand in your heart. Lord, I thank you for these people who are standing, Lord, and I thank you, Father. We declare, Father, that we will follow through on this. We declare, Father, that this is the best season of our life. We declare that this is the day you've made, and we rejoice in you, and we're glad in it. We declare, Father, that every day is a good day in you. Maybe some challenges, but they're all good days in Jesus' name. We declare we will be real with what we feel, and when we really are hurting, we're going to go to you and maybe go to a trusted friend and get prayer, Father. Yeah. And it's okay. Yeah. We thank you, Lord. There's no condemnation that we, we're not always on top, and he, he, he. We thank you, Father. You were touched by the feeling of our infirmities. Yeah. You wept. You had compassion, Lord, and I thank you for that. Even on the cross, you cried out, my God, why have you forsaken me? So, Lord, you felt. And so I thank you, Father, that we give ourselves permission to feel this day and to Be healed this day in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God.